Chris Martin, which, who is a guitar player himself, I don't know him. I think he's from the UK. He he asked me a question. So the 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 preamble to this is that um, I got into uh, this this person that called me copycat, and then on that thread where I posted on Facebook lots of comments, Chris Martin said, uh, well, that is all right, as it is your choice. I certainly do not judge you for that. I am guilty of following similar influences and probably nowhere near as good as it either. I have no idea how Chris Martin plays, but he, he says he's not as good at it as I am. I'm not, I don't want to say I'm particularly good at it, but I, I'm pretty good at making um, vocabulary from other players my own. And we'll talk about it more. But how do you justify a guitar teacher passing on the same again? Isn't that like teaching someone how to copy an imitator? So I'm teaching, he's saying, you might be teaching someone uh, to play like you and you're already an imitator. Uh, sure, that is going to go around in ever decreasing circles. So the first thing I want to say is like, I'm not an imitator at all. Um, I dare you to find an original solo I played. So not when I play someone else's solo, of course when I improvise myself to find the exact same solo from someone else. You won't find it because I'm not imitating. I use influences from other people to come up with my own solos. And uh, I have so many influences, right? Uh, literally hundreds of people. So what ends up coming out of the guitar is new, right? Because the combination of sources and my own sensibilities in that respect, because of course I have developed certain uh, taste a certain way of timing, a certain way of putting accents, a certain sound. It will sound like myself. Now, of course, I have a couple of main influences, mainly Stochel Rosenberg from the Gypsy Jazz side, Martijn van Etersen from the, the, the contemporary side, and also Pasquale Grasso, a bebop player. Those are my main influences. So most of the stuff I play could be traced back to those guys. But those guys have many influences their, themselves. For instance... Stochelo is influenced by mainly Django Reinhardt, Django Reinhardt and Paco Lucia. That's what he told me. Right? Uh, Pasquale Grasso is mainly influenced by Bud Powell, piano player, and Charlie Parker. Uh, Martijn van Etersen is uh, mainly influenced by um, a famous guitar player. I forgot who, but a famous guitar player. And John Schofield. So... They already have many influences. I use them as influences and I have many other influences. So what ends up is my own personal style. Now you might like that style or you might hate that style. That is of course a possibility, but it's not a copy. So that's what I reply. I reply, um, Chris Martin, you know, I think a lot of people that say stuff like you're teaching people to become imitators really haven't watched many of my videos. Um, I'm not sure that is true though. Uh, that's what I wrote. Um, because if you only watch the videos where I teach you to play a solo from someone else, you might actually come away thinking that I'm trying to teach you to play like someone else. But th then probably you haven't watched the whole video. Because if you watch the whole video, I actually talk about each of the phrases individually and how they might be used in an, in an improv. So uh, partly true, probably, what I say here. Uh, I'm not doing that at all. I'm basically just teaching people to improvise jazz solos by following the ways of most well-known jazz musicians of the past, by mastering new vocabulary through studying masters who have become come before you. That's what I said, like Charlie Parker, Lester Young, Django Reinhardt, Louis Armstrong, probably Eddie Lang also. And I bet if you talk to most famous jazz musicians now, not all, right, but most, they will point to, to people that influence them. Now, they might have not used the same method methodology as me, that like writing down all the stuff, but they have practiced phrases. And I would say it's the only way to start sounding coherent in a certain style. Well, how are you going to be playing a style if you don't know what has come before you, like very precisely? It's like speaking a language. If you want to, if I want to learn to speak um, Hungarian, how am I going to do that if I don't study <laughs> all the great Hungarian speakers that came before me? I mean, I could go there and just Get an, get an impression of what Hungarian sounds like and start <laughs> saying stuff that I think must be Hungarian, but I promise you, no one's going to understand me. And if I do manage to somehow say some Hungarian words, it's going to be so full of mistakes that are part of the Hungarian language, like rules, like grammar, that it will just sound 
funny, ridiculous. Nobody will take me seriously. And if I manage to somehow get the 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 grammar right and the vocabulary, then I might still sound like a very poor speaker because I didn't study the history of Hungarian language and great writers or speech speeches. Like the language has developed in a certain way um, to a high degree of aesthetically pleasing level, right? If I don't if I don't connect to that tradition, then I'm not gonna sound appealing to Hungarian speakers. This, the same goes for uh, for music and uh, for jazz, for improv, because basically, improvising is, is speaking a language. You you speak in a certain style, and there are rules. There are chords. There is rules about timing. There's rules about articulation, and you're not gonna get that unless you study the tradition, or study with a teacher who has studied the tradition and then is teaching you. That tradition. That's also a possibility. That's what I'm doing on my YouTube channel, right? So let's go on with our what I wrote. The only thing that I'm doing, which is maybe not common, is systemizing the process through the methodology proposed in my books. And that is, I think, also true, right? I wrote those books, and then in that in those books I propose a methodology of practicing vocabulary through the set exercises, especially book two and book three, and also in the comic book four, there's a third, certain methodology there. That's maybe not uh, what most musicians have done the best, although I dare to say that it's not completely new what I'm doing here, right? It's like practicing in all keys with a backing track or with some kind of backing, that's not new. But maybe the way I put it on paper very systematically might be new, but I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it can only be good to, to put structure into your practice sessions. Okay, in the end, nobody is imitating anyone because I use so many sources that the end result will sound completely original, yet stylistically coherent. That's what I was basically was saying. Everyone's sources will in the end be different, which will result in a different personal playing style. Yeah, that's important, of course. If you Let's say you only buy my book, um, book three, right? You have no... You have no experience with improv at all, and you buy my book three, or even you buy only my book two, and you just only play what's in that book. And let's say there's five people doing that. Those five people will sound all very similar. Not the same, mind you, because still in the process of improvising, they're making different different decisions of where to play the phrases, how to embellish the phrases, which I also talk about in the books. But they will sound very similar. But that's not different from five people that have studied Jung around on their own, which there are a lot of people that do that. And sometimes these people get labeled as imitators. That's true. I wouldn't mind being a great Jung imitator. There are some people that are basically that, and they are great musicians, they're great artists, and I, I love to listen to them. But if you want to get away from that, then just find more sources. So then buy uh, all my books, for instance, <laughs> right? Or buy books from several people, or do the work yourself. Start with a book of mine, and then you get the idea of, okay, I can practice like this, uh, I need to transcribe, and then do it yourself. So, that's to address the first allegation <laughs> of teaching people to become an imitator, and also the allegation of saying that I'm an imitator. I'm not an imitator, um, not at all, and that's not just me saying it, it's just transcribe any solo of mine and you will find that I'm not imitating any other solo. You, you won't find a similar solo. You will find similarities between my solos, but that's because that's my style. That's my language. If you, you um, analyze two uh, compositions by Charlie Parker or two solos by Charlie Parker, you will find the same similarities. And that goes back all the way into classical music, right? Like there is no... There's, there's a big difference between um, being an imitator or having a certain style. Well, I'm not sure if that's completely coherent, but uh, yeah. Let's go on, because there's m much more to. So, Scott 4. So, I, I, I made this um, thread myself, right? I just took out interesting comments and put them together. So, this is not the way the conversation went on my Facebook. This was all on Facebook. So, Scott 4 says... If he, and that's the original uh, person that was um, accusing me, not, not Chris Martin, but in the other thread, of um, being an imitator. If he wants to create a new language every time he speaks, more power to him. I doubt the listener would be able to understand him. 
There are only 26 letters. You copy other players to increase your musical vocabulary. Right. So this is basically actually what I um, said with the language. And that that uh, comparison to language is really very um, precise, I think. It's very one-to-one. Everybody is an improviser in their mother tongue and sometimes in a, in a, in a second language. I think Alex Wiertz, for instance, does, can be is an improviser both in Polish and English. He's in the chat. And Abruptum is an improviser both English and German. Because I know these guys. Right? And I am an improviser both in Dutch and English. And a little bit in French and a very little bit in German. I'm a very good improviser in, um, in Dutch. Very good. Like, very proficient. Right? Very proficient. High level. I could be a could be politician. In English, I'm a reasonably good improviser. I think my, my command of the English language is pretty good. Not as good as Dutch, though. And why am I such a good improviser in Dutch? It's because I've studied so much of the Dutch um, literature, and I've heard so many speeches, and I got influenced by other great Dutch speakers and writers. So there, there you go. Okay, let's go to the next. So uh, Matt Matarazzi, who is a member of my Discord, that's why the color here is different. And you can see he's a JM. That means that he has one of my books and finished uh, one of the very difficult exercises. If you finish an exercise in my book, you get a title, and his title is JM. That means, means jazz master. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, JM Matt says, learning the language of jazz is copying phrases from past masters. Right? That's my opinion. That's not everybody's opinion, by the way, but that's also my opinion. Django was a genius, but he still copied from Louis Armstrong, right? That's what I said. Uh, George Benson sounds like Wes Montgomery, but he has his own style. Yeah, George Benson obviously studied a lot of Wes Montgomery, a lot of Grant Green, but then probably also studied lots of horn players, right? You get those fast uh, lines combined with the bluesy uh, sound of Grant Green, Wes Montgomery. But his own, his own style, because he is an amalgamation or a sum of all the people that he studied. Uh, Jimmy Page doesn't sound like George Benson. However, Jimmy does sound like the blues masters that came before him. That's true. Right? Jimmy Page has studied all the, the traditional blues players before him, but he added something new. And now when you start studying blues, Jimmy Page will be one of the people that you need to study. Just like uh, Stevie Ray and, and um, I don't know, I don't know too many blues players, but probably also... Uh, What's the most famous blues player? I can't think of his name. He had a guitar that he gave him. Wow. Well, you know what I mean, right? You can see here, I don't know a lot about blues. <laughs> Matter of fact, Led Zeppelin is often heavily criticized as copying riffs directly from blues players who were less popular. So what? You want to speak English, you're going to sound like Monty Python. You want to learn Chinese, you're going to sound like Jackie Chan. So he's making the same points, and these are obvious points, and I think everybody that studied to improvise in this way... Um, will realize this. Uh, Alex says, do you think of learning music as learning a first language or as a foreign language? I think of it as a learning a foreign language because, well, that depends a little bit. If you are, for instance, a Sinti musician, not only Sinti musicians, but like every musician that grows up in a certain music culture from very young age and you hear that all the time and you're surrounded by people that play that music, then it's almost like your mother tongue, right? Let's say you grow up in Cuba, because I've, I've had experience with this myself. I've seen a Cuban musicians. Nobody has to explain to you how a clave works. Two, three clave, three, two clave, if you don't know anything about Cuban music or the clave. Like every music that has a groove in a Cuban musician's mind has either a two, three clave. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, that's a three, two clave. And the other ones would be one, two, three, four, mm, one, two, one, two, three, right? So every music can either have a two, three clave or a three, two clave. Now, if you're not a Cuban musician, didn't grow up there, it's very difficult to determine this. But because there's no rules, there's this, a certain kind of, I've asked many people, there, there are no real rules. But every Cuban musician will immediately identify Oh, this is two, three clave. This is three, two clave, right? They they know this. They grew up with it. So it's 
it's the same as as uh, knowing the uh, correct what do you call that when you subjugate a verb is that the called subjugation uh, it's the same way like like the rules of of the grammar in dutch i don't have to think about it i knew them before i learned them in school because i've heard it all the time so if you learn lang- if you learn music like that like a cuban child or a sinti gypsy jazz child right or or even classical music if you're if, if both your parents are great baroque players Probably nobody has to explain anything to you about the use of a vibrato in Baroque or a bowing. It's just ingrained in you. But for most people, jazz will be a second language because they will start with that like at 15 or maybe like at 20. doesn't mean that you cannot become a fluent player. Right? Just, that depends on how much time you, you put into it and in, what, in which way. Ah, I'm getting some blues players here. Robert Johnson, Eric Clapton, B.B. King. I was searching for B.B. King. Yes, Albert King. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next comment here. Barry Warhaftig. Also a player from Philadelphia, I think. From the US, right? He has a band that plays a lot. So he says, uh, emulating or modeling is a time-proven method for achieving one's goals. And not just in music. Self-help gurus like Tony Robbins recommend copying the traits and habits of the people that have been successful at your chosen field. This is correct. And I teach this skill a lot um, at my university. So I'm, a, I'm now a freelance teacher. I'm too busy with, with all of this stuff that I, I can be a regular teacher. So I'm a freelance teacher. But I was teaching for years a course on content creation, right? Uh, having a YouTube channel, recording I'm also an audio engineer, so recording uh, video, how to make videos. And the first assignment I gave everyone is to give me a list of five content creators they admired. And then they gave me the list, and then I would say, I want you to make something similar. Because that is the way to be able to judge your skill level. Right? You try to do something similar, and then you listen or watch in, in, the, in the case of a video, you watch back and then you compare it directly to somebody you admire. And then you, you can see the difference and you can see where you need to improve. And even if you can't see it yourself, you could go to another expert and they can tell you, you know what? Look at the colors in the, um, the video of this person. Look at the colors that you use, right? You, it's, um, you are crushing the blacks. And you can learn so much from that. Okay. So, uh, good comment there. And let's go on. And as you know, learning jazz, especially gypsy jazz, is heavily based on learning the lines of the masters. Right. It's not only gypsy jazz. That's basically all, all forms of jazz. Charlie Parker internalized Lester Young's solo. Exactly right. And built on them to create his own style. And probably all of the top gypsy jazz players learned Django's lines to get started. Well, I, I started with, with Stocholo. I think like many people did. But of course, I also studied Django. And now I did a lot of it because of the... The, le- the latest book I wrote about Django in the 30s. In this way, we can learn to be good improvisers, learn how to phrase on and on. The only caveat is that the player has to immerse themselves enough in the language to be able to improvise and have their own style. Well, yeah, okay, that last sentence is true, but that sounds a little bit um, like it's a thing that will happen automatically, which I don't think, I think you still have to put a lot of effort into that and be very deliberate uh, with that goal by using phrases in a solo, right? Force yourself to use it every two, five, one. If you have a two, five, one, league, force yourself to play it in multiple keys, force yourself to play it in, in, in different tempi. Maybe he means with that immerse yourself, but I think we can be more precise, but, but I think this is a good post. Let's go on. Oh yeah. Oh, he says something here about Stocholo. He says, I have first-hand accounts from players like Stockler Rosenberg from an interview that I did with him in Vancouver. He said that in the beginning he learned things like jungle lines on Sweet Richard Brown, but in that time he could only play it in the original key with other players, but then learned how it all works. Well, in fact, um, I've, of course, spent hundreds of hours with Stockler. This story is uh, correct, but it's a little bit different, so I wanted to um, elaborate. It's not only the key. Stochel learned to play three different Sweet Georgia Brown solos, <clears throat> or like two or three, f- from Django and, and also other players, but they were in specific tempos. So then when um, he, he recalls, uh, I think it was uh, Fabi Lafertin came to the camp and he wanted to play Sweet Georgia Brown in a very slow tempo or in a slower tempo, tempo than usual. 
And then Storlo noticed, because at that time, like he was 16, maybe 15, he could only play the solos that he learned. He, he wasn't really able to improvise. But then he noticed that none of the solos that he learned worked in that slower tempo. They just sounded boring and it needed more stuff. So then he asked Fapi, like, how do you go from this step of learning those solos note by note to what you are doing, like improvising? And then Fapi said, actually, you know, well, that will come in time. Uh, just be patient, you're young. But Stochlo wasn't patient, the patient type when it came to that. <laughs> So he, what he started doing was basically it's what we, uh, what I call or what we call studying licks. He started making new solos based on the phrases that he found in the other solos. So he, he came up with a completely new solo that he could play in a slow tempo. Right. So basically, what he was doing, he was taking licks that he learned from other solos and making a new order. And and he said I was and I started doing that with every tune. And then I had lots of solos I could play on all the tunes. And then it's very meta. Of course, he could combine those bigger solos. He could take the first half of a solo he made with the second half, right? So, and at one point, he had so much, many choices that he could just make, it, make the choices on the spot. Well, that's improvisation. And then he would start embellishing the lines and come up with his own things. That is just the process of improvisation. Like you could say, Stockler there invented the wheel again. Of course, he had no one to tell him this because in those camps, there are no real teachers like that, right? So the people that made it to the top that we know about, those are the people that basically invented the wheel when it came to this. They, they came to these realizations on their own. That's why in a gypsy camp, in a city camp, like maybe 50 people try it and you only hear of one or two. That's, those are the people that came to these realizations on their own. If you go to a, I would say, a good jazz teacher, and I have, I have thoughts about that also. Like, what is a good jazz teacher? Well, first of all, it needs to be somebody that can play themselves. This is very important because why would you ever go to a jazz teacher that if you hear them play, you don't, you're not attracted by what you hear? Because... Uh, Obviously, <laughs> these people didn't really test their own uh, practice methodologies. You know, those practice methodologies might still be good, but how are you, can you be sure if they can play themselves? That's the first thing. Second thing is, check out their teaching materials. So, that could either be a student of theirs that also plays well, or like a book or a video where they teach. And does the teaching methodology appeal to you? That those are the two things that need to be there. I think there are a lot of jazz teachers, also on YouTube, uh, that really can play that well. Or, you know, maybe let's say it differently. Maybe they can play well, but it doesn't appeal to me. Because I can imagine that people would hate my playing, right? I think I play well, but uh, some people might hate it. So then, then don't <laughs> use me as a teacher. But if you like my playing and like the way I teach, then yeah, use me as a teacher. And the same goes for uh, for any teacher that you would find, especially in uh, jazz. Classical music, classical music is a little bit different. I think then it's more important to actually look at the students of the teacher. But in jazz, the person that is teaching needs to be able to play. But that's not the only thing, right? Because there's lots of people that can uh, really play well, but cannot teach at all. That's also, of course, a bad teacher. Don't, don't go take lessons with that person, unless you are very advanced. Then, then, then would be can still be good. Okay, <clears throat> let's go on with uh, Alexander Tribudi, an esteemed colleague of mine, uh, great violin player, great audio engineer, and uh, he's also responded. He says, "I think Patrick Bartley nailed that one on the head. The problem is not to sound original or sound like yourself, because of course the uh, allegation is if you start copying uh, someone else, you cannot, you will never sound like yourself." But no matter what you do, you always sound like yourself. And that is also true. But right? even if you start copying Charlie Parker, only Charlie Parker, there's no way you will sound exactly like him. So in the end, you will sound like yourself, which could be then a bad copy of Charlie Parker. This is what you want to avoid by using more sources, right? But the hard problem here is to sound good. And I think this is a very good uh, comment because in the end, that's what matters. It's like, you have to just sound good. And with good, I mean that if we start jamming or you're on a gig and uh, somebody calls a tune and it's your time to solo, that you can play a good solo. 
That's the only thing that counts here. It's not if you can play a good chord melody. Right, that's nice, but lots of people can play good chord melodies that you would never ask for a jazz kick. Why? Because they cannot play a good solo. And there's also people that can play very good solos that don't really do chord melodies. But you would still ask them for a gig because of the good soloing. It's also by far the hardest thing to learn in jazz, right? Everybody can learn a cool voicing and learn some chord melody or, or learn a single lick. Everybody can do that. But to play a good solo, that is the hard part. That takes hours and years of practice. Don't, don't be fooled by that. <laughs> it is, everybody that can play a good solo has worked on it for years. And it, it demands a certain kind of respect for it, even if you don't, if, even if it's not your thing, right? So some people, that I hear, I see that all the time on YouTube. It's like, oh, you play so many notes. Like, not to me, but they could also say that to me, but I, I read it on other really great musicians. Oh, too many notes, no soul. I mean, okay, it's not your thing, but I hope these people know that the amount of work that went into it to reach the level of being a coherent Fluent improviser is just, it's its a crazy amount of hours, <laughs> years. So Monk, when asked why he sounded so original, responded, I don't know, man, all I wanted, all I wanted was to sound like Juke, but I failed. <laughs> That's a nice anecdote. I've heard that many times. Uh, actually, Stochlo said the same thing. Like, all he wanted to do was sound like Django. That's what he was trying to do. But he ended up sounded like Stochlo, and people love it. But initially, he was kind of disappointed that he didn't sound like Django. Um, there's no absolutely no problem in copying. On the other hand, and that's where I maybe respectfully disagree with my friend Christian, I think the danger that resides in studying shapes, now this is a different discussion, but okay, on the guitar is to eventually be playing stuff that you don't hear. To sound good, to make sense, and to build a good solo requires not only an ad addition, addition, Okay, let's say a library of good phrases, licks, but they also need to respond to each other to rhyme and ultimately tell a story. Many moments in the greatest solos are great not in themselves, but because they respond to what was just played before in a very satisfying way, using motives. It's just like learning a language. Okay, again with the language, right? Let me respond to this. Because, okay, I actually did respond to it. Let's, let's read what I responded. I think that the word shape is a somewhat abstract term. Some guitar players might mean a box shape, like the, the pentatonic box shape, right? I only actually know one. That's the only one I know, which I don't really use except for this lick. I, I use it for that lick. That's the only thing I use it. But that's what I, not what I mean with the shape. What I mean with the shape is what I write here. With shape, I just mean convenient fingerings for a certain musical phrase. So, for instance, this shape. That's a diminished arpeggio, G sharp diminished. Let me make the screen bigger. So, this is a G, G diminished shape. I call that shape, but it's basically just a fingering, right? It's like one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, two, one. And we have this box here. There's different things you could take. You could do this. Or like Django. Right? I th just think that these things are very convenient. This is the Stockler Rosenberg system. And I call it shape because I don't want people to think that that is the thing that you play. You just play this. No, I call it the shape because you can be creative with the shape. You could add some notes. You could go, uh, go uh, only play the, the top part. You could embellish. But you could do all kinds of stuff with that shape to make music. That's why I call it a shape and not a fingerings, because fingerings to me sounds very classical. Like that is the only thing, you use these fingerings to play this diminished lick, right? So a shape should never hold you back from being musical. So like, um, Alexander Tripodi here says, you should be able to sing everything you play. Yes, I agree. But I don't think that the point he's making here, that the danger of learning shapes that you don't sing, I don't think it works like that. Because there's lots of stuff that you really can't sing, right? If, if you play something like this, you cannot sing that, right? It's very difficult to sing a chromatic scale. And this is a chromatic scale with some skipped notes even. But... 
it's more about storing the sound of that in your head. And you can do that by singing. Some things are really great to sing. Let's say you, you play... Yeah, da, yeah, boom, ba, boom, ba. That's great to sing that line, right? But some lines are just meant to be very fast. They are very chromatic. Uh, they have weird intervals. You can spend a lot of time singing, but I would say store it in your head. And the most important part of that is storing it rhythmically. Like, let's say we play something like... Um, right? For me, the most important part of that lick... It, it, it's also actually a shape because you can you can do lots of stuff with it. Is that you know the rhythm is to bo do ba do da 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 do ba do right like the timing thing and the quarter note and the swinging eighth notes. But if you play this phrase in all twelve keys for hours on end, which is the exercise in my book, you will store the sound of this in your head <laughs> to such a degree that you will never be surprised if you play it. Like, the way I read Alexander's comment here is that you play a shape and that you're surprised on what it sounds like because, I mean, you're just moving your fingers. No, no, that doesn't work like that. I am never surprised by anything I play because I have played it a million times before. Not maybe in the exact same way, but that shape, yes, I've played that. I've played this thing many times, right? I know what it sounds like. Maybe I won't be able to sing it perfectly in tune, but I know what it sounds like. I'm never surprised, and I also know where it fits. If I play a solo, I know, okay, this is the place to play it. It will sound great here because, you know, it's triplets. I've played a bunch of eighth notes before. Um, it's time for some fast fireworks. This is the, the one chord, right? Or it's a two, five, one. It fits here. This is, it would be a great place. And I play it. And yeah, yeah it, it does sound great. Maybe sometimes it doesn't sound great. And I will store that in my head. I say, you know what? I shouldn't play it in, that, in those circumstances again because it doesn't work. So you teach yourself to be tasteful with all your shapes and to be musical through experience. I don't think hearing in your head before you play it is the answer to that because it, that's so vague, right? The danger of thinking like that is that sometimes you actually think of a shape that sounds nice and you won't play it because you don't hear it or something. That's just stupid. Just play it. There will be a point in time after playing it 100 times that you just will know exactly what it sounds like. But you have to, in the beginning, force yourself to play it. It's like um, um, I had a show, I was in a theater show a long time ago and then we had a director and he said, um, when you come on stage, I want you to smile. <laughs> Don't look like you're bored. Come on stage with a smile. Even if you feel stressed or sad or whatever, or you're sick, just start smiling. If you smile enough, at one point you will feel it. We did the show like five times a week and it just became a, a thing, you know, like we started actually laughing before we had to go on stage because we were all reminding ourselves to smile, you know, and we felt great going on stage. So... That's the thing that I mean, like um, in the beginning you have to force yourself to do something, but at one point it will feel natural and that will take a long time with a, fr with a lick, a really long time, some licks that might never happen, but I promise you the shapes and licks that will never happen with, you will never play them, right? You will never play them because uh, in the moment of a gig or a jam session where there's pressure on you to perform well, you won't do that, but you have to force yourself to do it in a practice session and then hopefully it will come out naturally during a gig. And then you're not just playing shapes, you are hearing it. Okay, let's see, some interesting stuff here in the chat. Yes, I speak fluently Russian with, without knowing the grammar. I went only first and second class there, but I could subjugate, improvise with language fluently. I read a lot in Russian as a child though, so I could recall any word, perfectly subjugated, because I read it somewhere and know how to properly put it in a sentence. Yeah, that's referring back to, if you grow up with a language or a music style, it's you won't have to think about the minute details to be correct about them. Alex Weird says, I think Alexander is talking about building actual solos. You're talking about building a mental model as a tool for soloing. No, I'm also talking about actual solos. I'm talking about actual, the, like playing the solos. But you probably typed this before I was finished with my story. But I'm talking about actual playing. There's lots of stuff I play in my solo that's very natural to me that wasn't in the beginning. Uh, for many reasons, could be technical, so something like this, you know. But you play something on D, you play. 
That was not natural to me at all, technically. With the double downs all the time. It was a horror, I couldn't do it at all. Now it feels like very easy to me, right? This is not something I have to think about. Um, and that's a technique thing, I realized that. But I had to force myself to do it all the time, and now it just feels natural. Uh, there's things uh, that are sound-wise or like har harmony-wise that didn't sound, felt natural to me. Um, for instance, like something like this. I just just a whole tone skill. Doesn't sound very natural to me. I would never sing that. I'd have a lot of trouble singing it. But this feels very natural to me now. Like on A7. Why? Because I practiced the hell out of this fingering. I I figured out this um, this thing of repeating back. And actually, I'm experimenting with that line uh, right now to put more into it. But I hear it now. When I there's A7, I see it on the guitar, but I also hear it. And I play it, and it feels natural. But it didn't come natural. I really had to practice this shape. Double Whiskey says that pentatonic is the only you have to know for rock, blues-based music. That was my only skill for the first 15 years of playing guitar. Right, but probably you know all five pentatonic boxes, right? Um, I only know one. You know why I know it? Because... Uh, this is a lick that actually Jimmy Rosenberg plays in his solo on Donna Lee. When it's F minor, he plays. He goes, he goes there. I thought it was so cool to play that on Donna Lee, where you have F minor to play. So I learned it from um, Jim Rosenberg, and later I learned, oh, that's the pentatonic box. But I don't know any of the other four. And I don't see any reason to learn it. You know what? Maybe I know them for some reason because of some lick I know, but I'm not aware of it. I think the master level of lick-based improvisation style is to be able to dis dissect a phrase into micro sections and be able to compose a solo that reacts and tells a story with those. Yes and no. Sometimes it's no, there's no point in in, in um, dividing into in micro sections because sometimes you just need the whole thing to make it sound great. For instance, let me think of something that. It's like that. Yeah, well, I have an example. Um, it's funny because it's both proving my point and your point. <laughs> so, for instance, this lick from Django for two dominant chords, do dominant chain. So C7, two bars, F7. That lick, right, it's a, it's a famous Django phrase from uh, Rhythm Changes, Dance Nuptial. You could just learn the first part, right? You could just learn that or learn that or just this, right? And you could just learn the second part for F7. But in fact, it's very important to be able to play that whole thing because the whole thing is what makes, gives it the most impact. Like on rhythm change, you start in D7. So he plays it twice even. And there's many phrases like that where knowing the whole thing is actually pretty important. And there's more, there's more stuff like that. For A7 to D minor, you could just learn the first part, but you're missing kind of a thing here uh, that, that, that makes it really awesome. So I think, yeah, breaking it down in micro sections can be very helpful, but it's not necessary. Let's Let's... Let's make that a conclusion. It's not necessary for, for you to be effective with the phrase. Sometimes playing the whole thing is great. So master level um, that you say here, not necessarily, I think. But yeah, it could be helpful. Let's go back to the discussion here. Actually, Alexandre Tripodi says here also that he, he thinks highly of my way of learning and teaching. But let, let's, let's read. Maybe he makes another point. I do think very highly of your way of learning and teaching. It's extremely efficient and you're a living proof of that having mastered multiple instruments at a very high level. Well, let's say high level. I would say two two instruments at a very high level. Not three at a very high level, but um, at the highest level, I would say, well, what's highest? But like say to the level where I could play with uh, on a stage with thousands of people and I'd be good every time, I would say it's one and a half. So violin, for sure, right? There's no, you could put me anywhere, anytime within jazz context and I'll make sense. I'll probably play good to great uh, I'm one 200,000 percent 
uh, confident that I'll, it'll be good. <laughs> With guitar, I'm, I'm getting there, right? I, I, I'd say right now I have a high level, and in most situations I'd be good, but it's not like violin yet. Although some things on guitar I could actually do better than on violin. Right? Your dedication and work ethic as an educator and a musician is humbling. Practically speaking, the only point I'm making is that hearing in your head or be able to sing the notes you're about to play is essential too. Uh, let me make that point one more time. This sounds good, but in reality, this is not true. If you, logically speaking, there's lots of stuff that you could play that sounds great that you cannot sing. One of them would be, uh, I'm just trying to think logically here, right? I'm not trying to be uh, childish or, I don't know, be kind of pedantic. But chord solos, you can't sing chord solos, right? If, if I teach you like a... Uh, you could sing the top note probably, but that's not what you're playing. You're playing chords. So how are you going to sing that? So, but then, then don't come at me and say, oh, you sing the rhythms. Uh, that's what I'm saying too. You, can, you sing the rhythms. But the chord solos, you can't sing. Uh, so, and that is also something that you will be able to hear in your head or you will know what it sounds like before you play it just because you've played it so many times. And you will know it sounds awesome, even if you cannot hear all those notes. But there's many other examples, like, like really weird lines, something like A7. It will be so difficult for you to sing that correctly that you probably sing it out of tune. So what's the point then of singing it if you sing it out of tune or have to slow down so much to, f to find the right note that you lose, lose the timing? There's no point anymore. So singing is very good, I think, as a learning tool, but you don't need to be able to sing it 100% accurately to be able to play it. I made the same point in the video where I was reacting to Barney Kessel, who was saying the same thing, but then when we slowed down his singing, oh, he was actually whistling, <laughs> it was very out of tune. So he, he was not whistling what he was playing. He attempted to whistle it, but it was out of tune. So there was no point. It's, it's just something that you tell yourself that's good. Uh, but um, I would challenge anyone to sing very complicated lines when they're playing the complicated lines, to sing them correctly. So it's not, it's not going to happen. I, I promise you. And especially not in time. Or like in, in, with a good swing tempo, like a tempo 280. And then don't say, well, but then you don't have to be able to do that. Why not? If that's the condition of you being able to play it well, then uh, that condition should hold for every tempo. If it doesn't, then it also shouldn't hold for the slower tempos. You just need to be able to know what it sounds like. I know that sounds vague, but that's the best way I can tell it. You know what it sounds like, and that translates into you knowing where to use it and when it fits in your solo. Hey, Christian, what are your thoughts on the idea of playing with intention? I've heard Gypsy Jazz musicians say this in interviews. Intention is an abstract term that could mean many things. When I would say intention, it means <laughs> that you're not absent while playing it. So that's not only a thing that you hear, but also a thing that you see. <laughs> I went to a concert <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago where uh, some, one of the musicians was chewing gum on stage. Well, that didn't matter how good he was playing. That was so distracting for me. That's the, weird, that's the wrong intention to be taken to stage, I think. So that's one thing. But the other thing is that uh, you are there when you play. So you're listening to yourself. So if you listen to yourself, then you have the highest chance of making artistic decisions that actually fit with what you want to bring. So that still might not be uh, agreeable to a certain audience member that doesn't like it. But the chance of you playing something that doesn't really fit with what you want to bring artistically is much greater if you're not there, which sometimes happens, right? You have people that are not there, maybe they're looking at the phones, something like that. So that's what I would mean with intentions, that you are there and play things that you want to play. Uh, but I'm not sure that other people mean that by intention. So... I'm not sure what it means. Um, if you're talking about me, I've studied solfege <laughs> in, the, in the university. But actually, I don't want to talk about classical music at all or that stuff because I'm not interested in it in the sense that um, that is a, the big problem of jazz education has been in uh, many uh, decades that people started using concepts from classical music to apply to jazz, which is ridiculous. We should never do that because th what happens, the next step is that you start judging jazz performance or music based on classical parameters, which is wrong. Never do that. 
Because then you get these ridiculous things like, oh, the voice leading was not as great as it was in Bach, which is not the point of Gypsy Jazz guitar comping. You should always go to theoretical concepts developed by the people that are in the music themselves, like Barry Harris. If you want to study bebop and you want to go into a theory way of studying it, then go to be Barry Harris. Don't go to some classical way of defining those things. That, that will give the wrong results, will also give the wrong impression to people that don't know anything about the music. Because then you get a lot of, I've, I've had this so many times, you get a lot of uh, theory teachers in the classical department saying stuff about jazz, man. Well, what are you talking about? You can't, you can't solo at all, you don't have t timing. What are you talking about? Go back to your corner. I'm not gonna say anything about a classical music from a jazz perspective. I mean, that I'm sure that happens, but that's stupid. Don't do that. It, that's, that's not how you should look at music, I think. So um, let's continue here. So, man, I'm rambling a lot. <laughs> man, I'm rambling a lot. <laughs> so, Brad E. Jensen says here, how does melody theme creation occur for you? Or what tactics would you use with coming up with something original? Could you maybe do a video on it? Well, I'm doing it right now. For me, I can only do it one note after another extremely slowly, either drone or one chord at a time. And oftentimes it is very rough as my music rhythmic groove knowledge is not that fast. Nor is my ear that great either. I'm still working on discerning between chords and actually understanding the underlying sound of some seventh extended chords. Top that off with a pretty horrible oral recall memory that peters out quite quickly after about 10 seconds. So let me address this. There's lots of stuff in here that I hear all the time that in some discussions or some, for some teachers might be very useful. But for me, this is not very useful because there's lots of stuff here, lots of skills in here that I think are not necessary to be a good improviser in my opinion, right? And I'm not saying that my opinion is the right one, it's just one opinion. But again, judge it based on the way I teach and the way I play. If you agree with that, then you should maybe listen to what I have to say about this. But here's the first thing. Let's work backwards. Uh, horrible oral recall memory. Um, I'm not sure what is meant by that, but if you mean that you don't remember what you just played, I think that is a skill that is not very necessary to learn if you learn phrases and licks, right? Because f learning phrases and licks is just drilling the fingerings, first of all, then applying them to songs. And trust me, if, if, if you take one lick and you work with that lick for 10 hours, it will be in your memory, no matter what you do. It's, it's very hard to get away from it. So that's the first thing. The second thing, a discerning between chords is completely a waste of time for me. I, I never spent any time doing that. Again, for, some, for um, a couple of reasons. The first reason is that any time I spend doing that, I cannot actually spend in practicing the skill that I need to be good at, which is playing a good solo when it's my time to solo. And hearing the difference between chords and playing good solo, there is no real um, relationship between that. And that's easy to prove because there's tons of people that can hear... Uh, can hear everything. I know a guy, you know, you play, you fall on the piano and he can say, oh, these notes, this note. But that guy cannot play a solo to begin with, right? Because he has no timing, he has no vocabulary, he has no sense of what it takes to play a jazz solo, right? So that's one category. And then I know some people that have, let's say, bad ears, right? But I'll address that later, that can play great solos. So there you show, there you can see there is no relationship between those two things. So for me, as a jazz improviser, I don't spend any time discerning between chords. Now, the other part of it is that you actually learn that skill automatically by playing jazz. If you start studying jazz and playing and jamming all the time, you will hear the same progressions over and over and over. And trust me, bro, <laughs> at one point, a crystal of changes will just, you will recognize it because you've heard it like 500 million thousand times. Same goes for 251. But even if you don't, doesn't matter. If you know the chord progression that you're playing on and you know when the 251 is there and you learn to know, learn how to hear form, which is very important. Can you distinguish between uh, the A parts and the B parts? And for that, you just need to uh, study uh, or learn a four bar inner feeling. I'm not going to address that now, but that's the, that's the only thing you need to learn for that. If you know the chords and you know what to play on them, you don't need to hear anything, right? You don't need to hear if the piano player is playing a flat nine or uh, a nine or a flat 13. If your line is good and coherent, it doesn't matter what the piano player is playing. 
right? As long as he's also working towards the one chord, it will work. I had a discussion once with a piano player on YouTube, and he was basically telling me like, you suck, right? Uh, your ears are the most important thing, because there was a video about where I said, don't, don't do ear training, study lines. So your ears are the most important thing, and um, you're just a bad teacher, you're, you're ruining the education of young jazz musicians. <laughs> and then I went to the first video I could find of him, where he was playing, he was a great player, by the way. He was playing with a vocalist, and then uh, the vocalist was singing the melody, and he, the, and in the melody was like a, I don't know, a 13 or something. But his piano voicing had a flat 13. So I showed him, said, in this video, at 6 minute 13, you're playing a flat 13 against a 13 of the singer. Now, it doesn't bother me, because the music doesn't stop there, right? It continues, right? The, 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 the line continues of the singer, the, the chords continue, so it's fine for me, but you should be really bothered by it, saying because he was telling me that you should be able to hear all the extensions to react to it. He wasn't even reacting to it in the melody, right? It's, just, it's not even improvisation, it's the melody. If he cannot even do that during the melody, how is he going to do that during improv? He's never going to be able to do that. Nobody is ever be able to do that. It just jazz moves too fast for that. In fact, the most boring way to play jazz is if everybody's playing the same thing all the time. It's like, this bar, we're going to play A7-9, guys. Nobody plays a flat 9. That's not how jazz works. And that's also not what you hear on great recordings. On great recordings, everybody is just heading for that one chord in the distance. And they're getting there in their own way. All right? The piano player might do it through all the chords. The solo player might be doing it do through... Um, uh, octatonic phrases. The bass player might be playing a third in the bass, which is really weird. Don't play a third in the bass if there's a flat nine on top. But in jazz, when music is moving, it doesn't matter. And even even in Bach, if we go to classical music, this happens. Right? So uh, I shouldn't have said that because I don't want to look at classical music. But it's not important to, to learn the skill for all of these reasons I just said. It's more important to learn great lines, okay? Let's go on. As my music rhythmic groove, groove knowledge is not that fast. Well, now this is important. You need to work on, well, music rhythmic groove knowledge, it sounds too big. You just need to work on swing eighths. Uh, if you, let's say, hey, man, if you want to play jazz, I don't know if he's watching, but if you want to play jazz, that is. Just if you want to play jazz. Like, I'm not talking about anything else. Just play jazz solos. Because that's what my channel is about. It's not about nothing else. You need to work on swing eighth notes. And I have a metronome system for that. It's in all my books. But basically, very short, a swing rhythm is a long note and a short note. Long, short, long, short, long, short. In any division you want, you could be very swingy, very short note like jungle, or you could be more straight. <clears throat> but you need to make a choice of what you want to do, and then you need to work on the consistency of it, so that every long note is the same length as every other long note, and every short note is the same length as every other short note. And you do that with a metronome, with my metronome system. So you need to work on that, of course. Okay, what tactics would you use to come up with something original? Well, <laughs> I don't really do that. Uh, I know very few people who have done that that sound great. Uh, some examples of I can think of maybe Peter Bernstein. Uh, but even he studied the tradition. But, I mean, you can hear in his playing, it's very original. Uh, Keith Jarrett. So far, those are the only two people that come to mind. So not Charlie Parker, not Django even, I think, because uh, there's lots of tradition in his playing. Although there, lots of stuff in Django's playing is very original. So maybe I could, play, I could put Django in that category of Peter Bernstein, uh, Keith Jarrett, Django. Uh, Charlie Parker was basically, uh, is, is original in a sense. You can hear, basically hear the influence of Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young in his playing. Well, <laughs> I could uh, name here a thousand jazz musicians that sound not original in the sense that you're talking about, like that they come up with uh, one note and then the next original note. No, it's all based on the language that they're speaking, the certain jazz style they're playing. So, yes, you striving to be original is great, but realize that there are very, very, very few jazz musicians that this applies to. And I wouldn't say necessarily that those jazz musicians are way better than the musicians that are not doing that. It's just a much di more difficult route to take. Now, some people want to do that, maybe. But I would say, so here's my strategy if you want to be an original. First, learn to play. Just learn to play. Just learn to play, man. I'm not talking now to Brett E. Jensen uh, personally. I'm just talking to anyone. 
just learn to play. Just get a good swing timing. Learn to burn choruses on the tunes that, that are played in your style. And after that, after you've had that level, that you can go out and play and have fun and, and, and be amongst other jazz musicians, now you can start working on being an original. <laughs> and you might discover that you don't actually want to or need to because you found a, a way to play that sounds great, that is original in some sense, because uh, you have many sources. Yes, he's watching, that's me. Oh, you are Brett E. Jensen. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm sorry I was a little bit harsh, but I mean it. I think a lot of stuff that you are concerned here with me is completely irrelevant to my goals. So your goals might not align with my goals, but if your goal is actually to learn to play a good jazz solo, then they do align. And then in my opinion, a lot of the stuff that's here is just a waste of time. Or to, to be worried about that. Just learn lines. Learn lines and start playing solos. So this was discussion one. Now I have another one, but it's very short. So.